Budgets are a reflection of values and priorities as much as dollars and cents. And the budget I proposed yesterday reflects the values and, and priorities that I have, which is to spare as many Minnesotans as possible the hardship resulting from closing a $6.2 billion projected budget cap. In particular, I'm grateful for the City Council President and the Mayor Coquet being here with me today to talk about the importance of my budget protecting aid to local governments, cities, counties, townships, and also to school districts by continuing funding uh, for LGA, for CPA, and for the school aid formula. All of which will mean to Duluth, Cloquet, and other taxpayers that they will have no state-imposed local property tax increases if my budget is enacted over the next two years. My budget also fulfills my promise to increase state funding for K-12 education in real dollars after the, above the amount that was provided for the increase in the expected number of students in our public schools over the next two years. And it restores a, a better tax fairness by asking the wealthiest Minnesotans to help during this critical time uh, by paying higher taxes. And, and it also protects 95% of Minnesota taxpayers from paying even one additional dollar of taxes because I recognize that with the property tax increases over the last eight years, that uh, middle-income Minnesota families, lower-income renters, senior citizens are already overburdened with taxes in this state. So it restores tax fairness, it protects the middle class, and still closes the $6.2 billion budget deficit. Uh, with that, may I turn it over to Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Dayton. And on behalf of Mayor Ness, who is actually down in St. Paul right now, and the Duluth City Council and the citizens of Duluth, I'd like to welcome you to Duluth for the, I know it's a very short visit, but really appreciate you coming and, and, and the work you're doing to get the word out about your budget because your budget means a lot to the people of Duluth. And as a, as a member of the city council and having been a member of the council since we really, the, the budget crunch started, um, it, it is a, a relief in music to my ears to hear what you're saying about local government aid. Certainly, as a counselor, the importance of local government aid cannot be stressed enough for, for, for the relief of the people who are paying property taxes. As, a, as a, a person who is responsible for the city budget, one of the people responsible for the city budget, it's really gotten to the point where we are up against the wall in terms of of what, what we have in terms of our money and our availability of money in terms of services. We have cut to the bone. We have sadly laid off people. And of course, nobody has asked us to, um, to decrease our city services. Our, our city citizens, rightly so, expect the city services that they provide, the plowing, the fire, the police, the parks, the libraries. We've had to cut some of, the, uh, some of those things, the libraries and the parks, much to the chagrin of our youth and, um, and, and the people who, who use them. Of course, most of the people who use those services are people who are below the poverty level or lower, lower income working class people. So this has touched us so much. And I, would, I, I know we're not out of the woods yet, but it is such a relief to have a governor who understands what is happening in local government and understands that no, there really, there really have been tax increases. The tax increases have been passed on to the property taxes, they have been passed on in increased fees because we have to maintain the services. And the fact that Governor Dayton and, and Lieutenant Governor Sol uh, Predner Solon understand this is really important. And I know the power of the governor because even though we had a DFL controlled legislature, for many years, we had a governor who was not supportive of local governments, and that certainly has affected us. So I know that your influence will be felt. And I just want to urge everybody who is listening, and if you're a legislator, to support the governor's budget because it's a really, really key to the survival of our cities and the survival of our municipalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Mayor Bruce Alford. I'm from Cloquet, Minnesota. Just a few hops given to jump away. And I want to applaud the governor for his budget for keeping his promise to K-12 education and local government aid for counties and, and, and cities. Uh, personal property tax in the state of Minnesota, in rural Minnesota, I should say, all state, 
has risen 77% in the past eight years, which is uh, very difficult for people that are either losing their jobs, uh, not getting uh, uh, raises and or retired who are, aren't getting any raises uh, substantially. It, uh, it, uh, local government aid is actually uh, sales tax collected by the businesses in the state of Minnesota which was promised in 1971 and say in your community so you could provide, everyone could provide fire and police protection and street maintenance at a level that uh, they enjoy down the Indinas and the Bloomingtons of, of our world who don't need local government aid. In uh, Greater Minnesota, from whether it be Woodbury, Worthington, or War Road, this will ensure that Greater Minnesota will, uh, will keep our core services for the people and not make any more drastic cuts. I know some legislators are saying that the local governments have to dig deep and have to take a look at trimming their, uh, their fat off their, their budgets. Well, I can say in the last eight years at Cloquet population 11,500, we've lost over six and a half million dollars in, in local government aid. And we can no longer continue to provide those core services any longer if we have to continue to uh, reduce our, our local government aid uh, through the state. And so I applaud uh, Governor David for his budget and, and keeping his promise, and uh, I want to thank him very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And let me ask uh, our Education Commissioner, Brenda Casillas, to speak briefly on the education reforms that are part of our proposal, and then uh, we'll respond to questions. And Commissioner Showalter from the Program Management Budget will be here to provide any detail that anyone requests to ask about the, the budget proposal. Commissioner Casillas. Thank you, Governor. Every Minnesotan has a stake in a better Minnesota. And the President said just a couple days ago that if we want to win the future, we have to first win the race and the, win the race of educating our children, even in a $6.2 billion deficit, and especially within a $6.2 billion deficit, we have to be responsible and smart about our investments. I believe that the Governor's commitment to education delivers on a campaign promise to invest in children and invest in a better Minnesota. So what we've done is not come with a long list, but instead we've invested in early childhood, all day kindergarten, and rewarding excellence and innovation for teachers who are getting great success with students and exceptional growth. We believe that there are some things we can do without money as well. And so one of the things that the governor has asked me to do and charged me to do is to make a better uh, Department of Education. So we plan on supporting our teachers in teaching, in teaching and learning is way, in the way that we reinvent ourselves uh, as a Department of Education. So we hope that teachers will feel our support in the future. To do this, this will take all of us together. If we hope to have better chances for every child to succeed and be successful, then these investments are what we'll need in the future. Our all-day kindergarten program is an optional program for schools, and it allows for all, all students to be able to have successful futures and get an earlier start in education, learning to read by third grade. Our early childhood is an investment in giving parents more information about quality day, uh, daycare and quality childcare out there, as well as quality teaching and learning. Our rewarding excellence is rewarding uh, excellence in growth. It's not out, outright proficiency, so it is looking at schools in the upper 20% who are getting exceptional growth with all of our students, which is very exciting and incentivizes teachers to share their best practices with other teachers, creating networks of success. And finally, just our innovation for closing achievement gaps. We believe that by providing some seed money for teachers and schools to be able to uh, look at new strategies for a, a long time uh, underachievement will be a way to spawn some new excitement around the closing of achievement gaps. Again, I thank you for this investment, Governor. I think it's very important for our future in Minnesota, and I believe Minnesotans are ready to stand up behind you on this one. Thank you. Good to respond to any questions. Yes. Governor, uh, the Business Federation says if your budget is approved, it will bring the top tax rate in Minnesota to the highest in the nation. That's something Minnesota wants to lead the nation in? Well, the, the rate uh, temporarily <clears throat> would be, because the surcharge would, would be the highest, but in terms of overall uh, state and local taxes per capita, our calculation is that uh, if my budget were enacted, Minnesota would go from the 12th highest state in the nation to the 10th highest. So we would not be one of the very highest taxed uh, states in the nation. 
and, and my budget restores a, 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 an equality to the taxation in Minnesota, because today, according to the Minnesota Department of Revenue, the wealthiest 10% uh, of taxpayers, and uh, particularly the wealthiest 5% would be affected by my budget proposal, pay a, a significantly smaller percentage of their income in state and local taxes than do the other 95% of Minnesota taxpayers. So my tax proposal specifically asks the, those who are most successful, the wealthiest Minnesotans, to, to pay their same share of income in state and local taxes as the rest of Minnesotans. I think that's just basic tax fairness. Yes? Um, I think we're all aware that a lot of the economic problems we have now are caused by decisions made in the past. Right now, the decisions are being made regarding perpetual treatment for waters coming from an enormous open pit mine um, upstream from Duluth. How will you protect the economy and the fiscal soundness of Minnesota in the future from the cost of perpetual treatment? Well, I believe as Commissioner of Economic Development in the past that sound economic development and strong environmental protection are complementary objectives and most Minnesotans, virtually all in fact, want both. So it is uh, my responsibility now, along with uh, Commissioner Landwehr of the uh, DNR, Commissioner Austin of the PCA, to, to make decisions uh, to assure Minnesotans that their air and their water and their, their soil are, are going to be protected for now and for future generations. That's a responsibility that I take very, very seriously. Yes? Um, one representative of Huntley was here on Tuesday and he talked about uh, his hope that the budget cuts would not be um, unfairly at health and human services. And I wonder if you'd talk about the impact of your budget on Well, the net, net cut for health and human services is 2.8%. Uh, there are reductions. There are also uh, fee increases uh, on providers. And the health care plans in Minnesota recent analyses have shown are, uh, this, the, the arrangement has been very lucrative. Uh, that's been part of the driving force in higher health care costs for Minnesota, so we are asking the health care plan providers to uh, take a reduction in their administrative overhead. And I, I will, if, with the new revenue forecast in a couple of weeks, if there are ways that I can restore some of the, the uh, cuts that affect people the, the, the hardest, I will sort of look for that. But our, our goal and my goal with the Commissioner of the Human Services, Jessen, was to even in the areas where cuts were necessary to target uh, those that those who were least in need, and I recognize that those needs still exist. Uh, we we reduce the eligibility for Medicare and the state-funded health care from from down to 200 percent of uh, federal poverty level, which uh, for a family of four is forty-four thousand dollars. So, uh, it, you know, those are still challenging economic circumstances for, for someone with a family of four. But it's again the where the cuts were absolutely necessary, we targeted at those who were relatively better off and, and tried to protect the, the social safety net for those who are, are truly destitute or close to it. And I, I said all along this budget would not be painless, and there's no, there's no good way, there's no easy way to solve a $6.2 billion deficit, which is 19% of projected revenues for the next biennium. And these were very, very difficult decisions. I tried to draw the line to, beyond which I felt the further cuts would be barbaric, and ones that would violate my values and the values of most Minnesotans to, to care for the poorest and neediest of our citizens, while at the same time recognizing that we have to cut the spending on an overall basis because of the f fiscal realities that we face and that we'll continue to face. The, uh, one more? Sure. The uh, Republican majority in the House and Senate has kind of drawn a line in the sand on tax increases. What what are your hopes of being able to resolve those differences? Well, now it's incumbent on the legislature to produce its alternative. I, I challenge anyone who's critical of my budget to produce a better alternative. And that includes all of the legislature who will now have that opportunity in the next uh, two months. And uh, then we'll have a chance to sit down together in the last weeks of the legislative session. We'll have to resolve our differences. It will involve compromise on both sides. It's, uh, the essence of reaching an agreement between any two parties who have uh, different views of a matter is to both sides are going to have to compromise. I'm prepared to do my part and I trust that they will do their part as well. Any other questions?
Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it very much.